We Survive Physical Death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on our show, I am honored to have Scarlett Lewis with us. Scarlett is a mother, an artist, an avid horsewoman, and an advocate for peace. She is the founder of the Jesse Lewis Choose Love Foundation, which she started in honor of her six-year-old son, Jesse Lewis, who was murdered at Sandy Hook Elementary School, along 19 of his classmates and six teachers in one of the worst mass murders in U.S. history, which happened in December 2012. The foundation's mission is to start choose love movements throughout the world by spreading a message jesse left on their kitchen chalkboard shortly before he died which he wrote nurturing healing love following jesse's death scarlet wrote nurturing healing love a book about her journey of turning personal tragedy into something that can positively impact the world Scarlett is the recipient of the International Forgiveness Award, the Live Your Legacy Award, and the Common Ground Award for her advocacy work for peace and forgiveness. She's also the author of a children's book, Roses Foal, about the most important lessons a mother can teach her son. Her website is jessielewischooselove.org, or of course, you can visit wedontdieradio.com and click on her link to her website and find out more about Scarlett. So I have said enough. Scarlett Lewis, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you so much for having me, Sandra. Oh, I'm just so honored you're here. You and I have been Facebook friends and email friends, and, um, and I'm just really honored for the first time to get to hear your voice. Yes, I feel like I've known you forever. I know. It's it's interesting how that happened. Now, Scarlett, you, I mean, I remember the day back in 2012 that that all happened, and, and I, I grew up close to that area. So it's a very tender subject, and I know that you've been interviewed a number of times. Uh, I know our, our show is about life after death, but I don't know where to start as to ask you a little bit of the backstory, maybe about who you are and, and like how you like to describe your story and, and what you went through. So is it okay if you kind of lead the conversation and and where we go a bit yes of course i mean that i i uh i've pretty much always been a single mom so i was a single mom of two boys the sole supporter of the household and uh, a working mom and uh, december 14th started like any other day running around getting the boys uh ready for school jt uh, is Jesse's older brother, so he was 12 years old at the time, took the bus early, uh, and then Jesse and I had our time where we kind of played after JT left and got ready, and I drove him uh, uh, to daycare, and then I would usually go to work. That morning, uh, his dad picked him up um, and took him to school, walked him outside, uh, to meet his father in the driveway and, uh, you know, running late as usual <laughs> and scurrying around right. and uh, turned around to give him a hug goodbye. And I noticed that he had written um, in the frost on my car, on the, on the windows with his little fingernail, I love you. Nice. And he had drawn little hearts on the other windows. And, and I just knew that that was one of life's moments. And I said, uh, despite the fact that we were all running late, Jesse, stay right here. I'm going to run in and get my phone and take a picture of this. So I ran inside, got my phone, situated him in front of the message so I could get a picture of him and the window, um, took a couple pictures, even erased one because it was overexposed, <laughs> and uh, and then gave him a big hug and sent him off, uh, went to work. Um, I worked 45 minutes away from our town and the school and uh, started getting reports of a shooting in Sandy Hook, you know, and I wasn't even really, I mean, it's a terrible thing, but nothing can ever happen to your child. It's right. just not even in, in uh, you know, this is not even a thought that we can have. Yeah. And exactly. uh, even, even when I found out it was a, it was a shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary and I left. Um, because uh, all the kids were going to be picked up by their parents at the firehouse, which is at the end of the cul-de-sac where the school is, I still wasn't worried. I mean, you know, nothing can ever happen to your child. No, this happens to other um, people, I, these things, right? Right, never to you. So uh, so I'm driving the 45 minutes. I've got friends calling, uh, giving me updates. 
Um, and I, I heard that a teacher had been shot in the foot, and I thought, you know what, most likely uh, jealous boyfriend, you know, and, oh, sh scary for, for Jesse, but, you know, we'll pick him up and everything will be okay. So um, by the time I got to the, uh, the school, I had to park about um, a quarter to a half a mile away, and uh, there were helicopters, emergency vehicles, army vehicles, and I thought, oh, my God, what is going on? So I park along the road and actually start running to the, uh, to the firehouse, and I see I'm there with all the kids that are, have been released and parents, you know, calling their children's names. It's a little bit chaotic, and I'm looking for my little brown head, and, uh, of course, he's not there. And so I'm, I'm going up to anybody official looking, have you seen my son? Um, his name's Jesse Lewis. I just, you know, can't find him. Uh, the firehouse is clearing out now. Um, well, if you, if, if you don't have, uh, if you haven't found your child, go to the back room and put your name on a list. And I thought, I'm not going to the back room. Somebody said, uh, I think I saw Jesse. He was next door. So I ran next door. There's a little yellow house. I banged on the door and uh, this older man answered the door and said, yeah, I think Jesse was here. And I think that he ran over to the daycare center on the other side of the school, which is where Jesse used to go to daycare. So I ran over there and, uh, you know, and I'm texting with his father who is now there too. And, uh, and I'm saying Jesse is definitely, you know, not here. Um, check the hospital. So he's running to the hospitals and uh, we just don't know what's going on. I still, I mean, I'm nervous, but nothing really, I just this weird kind of, I guess, defensive mechanism. Nothing can ever happen to your child. So finally I go into the back room put his name way down on this list of missing people and uh, am told, uh, you know, the, you know, kids are hiding, uh, they're sweeping and re-sweeping the school, they may have run out into the woods and, and they're hiding, we're, we're looking for them and I'm, and I'm thinking, of course, you know, knowing Jesse, who is so, you know, brave and scrappy, he's led a contingent of kids, was my thought, out into the woods, it's going to take them hours to find him. So um, at this point, um, my mom lives in town and my stepfather, and so they were texting me, you know, we're going to come over. Uh, my stepfather got coffee from Dunkin' Donuts, and, and JT, who is at the middle school, texted me, can I come and wait with you? Well, of course you can come and wait with me, was my thought, because we're, we're going to get Jesse. He's going to want his big brother. We're probably, we'll probably all go out to dinner and talk about this. And, you know. Right. So... Uh, so we're at the firehouse. It's uh, chaos. People are demanding answers. The teachers are coming from the school. Somebody got pizzas. And, you know, they're saying, well, I have some pizza. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, are you serious? I'm trying to question the teachers that have come out of the school. They're kind of giving each other sideways glances. But I'm not wanting to read that, I guess, you know. So, I, uh, so what I did was I just moved my family as far away as possible from what I consider just sheer chaos, which was that room that they wanted to keep us all in. So we stayed outside. They kept us just outside of the line of media. And we sat there in chairs um, and uh, waited. Um, and, you know, throughout the day, we knew after everyone else knew. I mean, the, the, the public and the media had spread the word, but we didn't know the families that were waiting at the wow. firehouse. And, uh, and so, um, you know, a, a policeman would come up and say, um, do you have a picture of your son? Any identifying marks? And so, you know, I went into his police car and charged my phone and gave him a picture. And it's just kind of a, a slow dawning of what could have happened. You know, my mom was saying, I remember her at one point saying, um, your brothers are, are coming, you know, one, one coming up from Derry and the other driving down from Boston. And I was like, don't have, what? This is not that big a deal. Don't have them come all that way. Why are they coming? You know, but kind of in the back of my mind, this slow realization, and actually it was a blessing. It didn't hit me all at once. By the time, late that afternoon, by the way, some person, some guy came up to me, knelt down and said, there's no easy way to say that your son's dead. Turned and walked away. To give you an idea of the chaos, oh. there were policemen that came up and grabbed him and said, what did this guy just say to you? And I said, he told me my son's dead. He wasn't supposed to say that, all this stuff. But I already knew at that point. And, um, and uh, you know, at one point, JT had broken down 
we were knee to knee in chairs and kind of had our arms around each other. And he said, uh, what, what if Jesse doesn't come back? You know, we're, we're not going to be okay. This, this is not going to be okay. And I said, you know what? If Jesse doesn't come back, we know exactly where he is. We know that he's okay. And we're going to be fine. It's going to be harder for us but we're going to be okay. And so we just kind of cried together. And I remember kind of like rising out of my body, looking down at the two of us from overhead and thinking, how do you know? What are you saying? You know, where is this strength coming from? Yeah, exactly. And um, I didn't really know, but I, I really truly felt it. And, and I was so thankful for that. So, um, and you know what? And, and, and after that man came up and told me that, we left. I really didn't have any sort of awareness at all about the enormity of what had happened. I, I saw kind of out of my peripheral vision other families screaming and collapsing, but it was like I couldn't, I couldn't um, really handle <laughs> the enormity. I could only handle my part of, of what had happened. So I went home that night um, just really in shock. Yeah, um, my stepfather gave me a huge sleeping pill and I knew I had to sleep to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to keep my strength for JT. That was my main concern. So JT and I curled up in my mom's bed and, and went to sleep. The next morning I woke up, went down into the kitchen, um, you know, just with that horrific, sick feeling, uh, made myself a cup of tea, sat down with my phone and looked at a text and the first text I got was from Neil, Jesse's father, and he said, uh, Jesse's eulogized on the cover of the New York Post. Oh. And I was like, What? That doesn't why? That that doesn't make any sense. Why why would that have happened? And I clicked on the link and up came the cover of the post, uh, with a number of people that had died and I just dropped the phone and I just burst I just uh wailed because I, wow. I could not believe the enormity of it. And, uh, and, and so then it just kind of went on from there. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Oh, my heart goes out to you. I, I, I can't yeah. even begin to imagine. Can't. It, it's really, really hard to imagine that something like that happened. And even me listening to you, re you know, sharing the description in the beginning of the call is always difficult. It's like, how could something like that happen? It's still... Um, really unbelievable to me. Yes. Still, three and a half years later. Oh, yeah. I think it, probably for your life. Um, probably, um, yeah. But I, I do know and believe in my heart, and I, I think you may as well, that sometimes out of tragedies comes, uh, I don't know if you call it your life purpose, but I do know that you've made a profound difference on planet Earth since all this happened. So um, something came to be that uh, gave you strength to push forward and make such a difference and we'll get into that in, in just a bit how old was your son JT when, when this all happened JT was 12 years old yeah and Jesse was six so he was the older brother and um you know I mean I, I'm going to share how he responded um to the tragedy which is uh generally people's favorite story uh, of okay. all of them but learn so much, and, and one of the things that I've learned is that we, um, the thing that we all have in common, the thing that really unites us and bonds us um, is not joy. <laughs> it's suffering uh, because everyone suffers um, to a certain degree. And, um, and I've also learned, um, interestingly enough, that, um, you know, we, there tends to be a focus on negative aspects um, in our society, um, such as post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, everyone knows about post-traumatic stress disorder. I did too. So right after, I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm going to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. And I wonder how that's going to look for yeah, me. And sure. so I started looking for signs. Okay, sleepless nights, that's one of them. What, how, you know, what, what else is this going to look like? How bad is it going to get? I wonder if I'm going to be, you know, committed to an institution. I mean, really, these are the thoughts that are running through my head. And um, later on, I learned about something called post-traumatic growth. And uh, huh. post-traumatic growth is a thing. It's Googleable. It's researched. It's, it's a term just like post-traumatic stress disorder. And the interesting thing I learned is that 
Um, roughly 3% of our population suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, but the vast majority of us experience something called post-traumatic growth, whether we know it or not, uh, whether we're aware of it or not. Um, and post-traumatic growth is when you uh, grow from a traumatic experience. When you, and there's a whole list of things that happen that the majority of us experience. There's no timeline, right. but, um, but the majority of us gain strength, as you said, um, that we never knew that we had. We um, gain perspective. We find um, uh, missions and purposes in our lives. We strengthen relationships. Some relationships go by the wayside, which is fine. And uh, there's just a whole list of benefits. And, and so kind of that's, that's been incorporated into my message because I think that um, if we could plant this seed in our children that, look, yes, you know, everybody's going to go through difficulties. And difficulties are actually opportunities for growth. Yes. And, uh, and, and we talk a lot about resilience. Um, with our kids and, and within ourselves. Resilience is when you bounce back to where you were before the incident, right? That's right. being resilient. Post-traumatic growth is exponential growth. It's, it's, it's going way beyond where you were before the tragedy. It's getting better than you were. It, it's, it's gaining more strength, more perspective. And, uh, and so I really feel like both JT and I have experienced um, post-traumatic growth. And, and by planting that seed in people's heads, um, not something that you say right after somebody's been through no, something. Wow, yeah, you yeah. know, you should be grateful. This is yeah. a tremendous opportunity. How wonderful for, for you, yeah. Right, right. But, but um, if you have that seed planted beforehand, then it kind of takes the fear out of the incident. And you can look at it in a different way. It doesn't make it good. It doesn't make it not painful. But you can gain a different perspective and say, okay, this is happening. Where are the lessons in here for me? And, and how can I use this to my benefit? How am I going to grow from this and become a better person? Yeah. Um, Scarlett, do you believe in life after death? Absolutely. Can I ask why? Yes. I mean, and I say before Jesse died, I believe. I mean, I have a traditional faith. Um, and so I believe that when we die, we go to heaven. Mm -hmm. And uh, and after Jesse died, I got absolute proof. Um, and I feel so undeserving because um, I know people look for signs their whole life. And I actually got them. And I am so thankful for that. And so whereas I believed before, I absolutely know with certainty now that um, that life continues. And I, I've had so many instances that I write about in my book, um, could Nurturing you give us, Healing Love. Could you give us a few of the, the things that had happened? Because I know oh, I have God. mothers listening right now who have lost children yeah. and you know, all yeah. of us have lost someone close. But yeah, if you could tell us a little bit of that journey. I'd love to. So um, starting off, uh, when, I, when I came home a few days after, I, I went to my mother's who lives across town thinking that I would never be able to go back to my farmhouse where I raised my two boys. Um, but I, I um, was told, uh, if you want to pick out Jesse's clothes for his casket, then uh, you're going to need to go home. So I did, surrounded by a bunch of people a few days later, picked out his clothes in his room, turned around, was walking out, and I found a, a uh, message that Jesse had written on our kitchen chalkboard short, sometime shortly before he died. He wrote three words, nurturing, healing, love. And I knew immediately, as soon as I saw those, that that was a message of comfort for his family and friends that he knew that he was not going to be on earth for that much longer. And he wanted to leave us a message to, to comfort us in his absence. I knew, I just knew that instinctively, but I also knew that it was something more than that. I knew that it was a, a message of inspiration for the world. That was where we had to move towards and that I would spend the rest of my life. Uh, spreading this message of nurturing, healing, love. 
nurturing, healing, love, those three words are not in the vernacular of a six-year-old. They're not something a six-year-old would say. They were phonetically spelled because Jesse was in first grade and just learning to write. Wow. Uh, I knew that it was a prophetic message. I, I actually called a professor from Western Connecticut State University in Danbury. He's the director of the Compassion, Creativity, and Innovation Center. He's a neuroscientist. He's brilliant. And I brought him to the house and I showed him the, the chalkboard and he said, whoa, this is not just a little boy writing a message. And I said, I know. And he said, let me take some time and, and look into this. So he did some research and he called me back and he said, those three words are in the definition of compassion across all cultures. And we, we broke down the meaning of the three words. Nurturing means loving kindness and gratitude. Healing literally means forgiveness. Love is compassion in action. When you practice those three character values, in that order, you are choosing love. And, and so basically he left us a formula for choosing love. And that is um, what I base my talks on. It's what I base the, the uh, Choose Love Enrichment Program, a free pre-K through 12th grade program that we're developing, all on this profound formula for choosing love um, with one more character value, courage, because uh, we found out on that day um, that Jesse had been instrumental in saving nine of his classmates oh. before losing his own life. And, um, and I knew when I was waiting at the firehouse, uh, I, had, I knew that if he was not coming back, that he had done something brave um, because that's who Jesse was. And I, I just knew that he had um, tried to save his beloved teacher, Miss Soto. And, and I just knew that that had happened. And uh, it was really interesting because three days later after the incident, we actually met with President Obama. He came to Newtown High School to give an address to the country, and he met individually with each of the families. Wow. And um, I had Jesse's picture on my phone, and he came over to me and gave me a hug and, and said, can I see a picture of him? And I, so I brought it up on my phone, and I showed it to him, and I said, you know, I want you to know that he um, died uh, trying to save his classmates. And uh, he, and I, we had known that from police reports um, at that point, even days afterwards, we knew that. And um, he, he looked at the picture and he said, can I look at that a little bit closer? And he took the phone out of my hand and he really examined it for a long time. Wow. And he said, I can tell by looking at his face that his actions did not surprise you. And it was just such a present thing to say because they didn't surprise me. I had already known that. So it was really, it was really a beautiful thing um, that I wanted to share. So, so the, the message, um, nurturing, healing, love, uh, that was definitely um, a sign from Jesse. That same day, um, we, we had been receiving so many signs, by the way, um, even in the first couple of days. We had blinking lights. We, everyone was waking up at 3 a.m. having dreams. My brother dreamt of, uh, you know, like an Indian warrior that was standing over his bed. Someone else had a vision of Mother Mary. Um, who asked her to come and, and tell me that she weeped uh, with me and, and, and asked this woman to wash my feet. Just incredible, beautiful things. And I just was open to it all, thinking, yes, yes, I believe this. Yes. Um, we had a light on the outside of my mom's bathroom. And people, I had friends from all over the country flying in, and, and some of them have no belief. Um, basically atheists and, uh, and they would come down and they would have had an experience with the light, uh, turning on and off. In fact, one of my friends was like, what, which one is this light? Is it this? And she was like, look, and she, she like turned it off or something and it turned on and it's like, for oh some reason, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, you know, uh, people would come down, tears streaming down their face, knowing that they'd had an experience with Jesse. Um, that same day that I found Nurturing Healing Love, and, and I wasn't, really wasn't thinking about JP and, and whether he had been seeing signs. I didn't ask him about it. But on the way out of the house that day, 
he came up to me and he said, Mom, you know how everybody's been getting signs from Jesse? And I said, yeah. And he said, I got a sign too. And I said, you did? What is it? And he pulled out his wallet. He opened it up and he pulled out this little piece of paper that he had found on his desk folded because at the same time I was getting Jesse's clothes, JT was in his room getting chargers and, you know, all that stuff that a 12-year-old would get. And uh, he opened the note and the note said, have a lot of fun. And that was such a profound message for JT because whereas Jesse was bouncing off the walls. Like I can literally think of two times that Jesse cried in his life. Other than that, oh, wow. he was <laughs> so loud and happy and, you know, really took a lot of attention with his energy. JT, on the other hand, is less exuberant. You know, he needs to be uh, grabbed and conjoled and tickled, you know, to, to really let out a hearty laugh. And, uh, and so that message was so perfect for JT. What a perfect last message from a little brother to his big brother. But I also saw that as as having larger implications because I thought, you know what? That's really why we're all here as well. While we're having, while we're practicing nurturing, healing, love, we're supposed to be having a lot of fun and we can't lose sight of that. So um, it's also a big message for uh, for us. But I, I, ha I have other um other messages, and I would like to share one story sure. that happened. Um, so uh, the, the Christmas was two weeks after um, the tragedy, yes. and so I, I, my whole family was gathered at my mom's house, and everyone has two little children, <laughs> and uh, they're all boys, and they're they were all younger than Jesse, and so I'm sitting there. I remember just in agony, really. I mean, you know, everyone's distracted. The little kids are running around having a great time, and I just it was so difficult for me and for JT. And so I I made a decision on Christmas uh, that we were going to get away, JT and I. That we we needed to get away to reconnect as a family of two that we are now, and so. I made, I just got on the phone and I made reservations for JT and I to go to Orlando and we would go to whichever one is Disney World or Disneyland because we'd been there one other time with mm -hmm. Jesse mm -hmm. and uh, I felt safe there and I just wanted to get away. So within 24 hours, we were on our way to the airport. Um, there's a huge blizzard. So my stepfather's driving us and he gets his pop up on his phone. Um, we were, I think we were leaving from Westchester airport and our, uh, the origin of our flight had changed. It's never happened before. We turned around and went to a different airport. Yes, um, and happen. then when we, right. So when we get to the airport, our, our flight was delayed three times and I'm saying this for a reason. Okay. So we finally get on the flight. And everyone gets a free movie because of um, because of all the flight the weather delays. So I'm sitting next to JT. Everyone's you know enjoying their Coke and their peanuts and watching the movie except for me. My movie won't work. It's flashing, flashing, and then flashing down 20 channels to Jesse's Girl. And then I'm trying to get you know it finishes the song. I know the song is for me. I know who's playing it for me. It's Jesse. Wow. And I'm thrilled. And so I, I, I try to go up the, to the channels and I see, a, I see glimpses of the movie and then it goes back down uh, 20 channels to the radio station to like missing you, love you, wish you were here. I got oh, my phone Scarlett. at those and I'm writing down every single word as it comes out of this song because I know it's for me. Right. JT is kind of looking over at me and he's trying to help me get the movie working. And at, at one point he finally goes, Jesse? And I said, yes, I think it is JT. So at this point, it's two, pretty, pretty much two weeks after the tragedy. I am not really talking to anybody. Um, I'm still at my mom's. And, uh, and nobody knows that we're going away except for, you know, my close, close inner circle. So we land in Orlando and I get a text message from a friend. How is the flight? And I text back and I say, Jesse was all over this flight. I was getting, you know, I was messing with the electronics, sending me messages through songs. It was incredible. And they wrote back and they said, sometimes spirits linger because they want to make sure you're going to be okay. And I, I knew what I had to do. So 
I didn't tell JT this was our fun healing adventure. Um, so we get off the plane. I say, JT, can you um, stay with our bags at the, at, you know, right at the so, women's yeah. bathroom? Okay. Well, at the bathroom. And I, I'm going to run in and I'll, I'll be right back. So I went into the bathroom and I, I went into a stall. I shut the door and I just started bawling. And I said, Jesse, uh, if, if you're lingering to see if JT and I are going to be okay, we're going to be fine. Um, I want you to go be in the arms of Jesus. That's what I believe. Um, I, I, we're going to be fine. Um, we'll meet you there, you know. And and if if you can be in both places at once, that would be fantastic. But if you're lingering here, don't linger here. Go be in the arms of Jesus. And and I really felt like I was sending him away. And so I I I went, came out. I rinsed my face off. Went out to JT and said. Okay, JT, let's start our healing adventure. Let's go rent our car. So we rented our car. I said nothing to JT, obviously, about that because I didn't want to make him sad. I wanted no. him to be happy. Yes, of course. So we rent our car. We drive out of the Orlando airport driveway. We turn right on whatever that highway is there. Uh -huh. And there written in the sky, in skywriting, is Jesse and Jesus together forever. No way. <laughs> it was so crazy. So I pull over and I, I get out my phone. I'm taking pictures. It's amazing because everything that always happened to me, I always had somebody with me. <laughs> Multiple people, someone there. There's always, there's always evidence, thank goodness, and because it's such an unbelievable story. So I pull over on the side of the road. I'm taking pictures. I, I look at JT. It's his total silence, and he goes, Jesse's with Jesus. And I said, I know. And he didn't know about the prayer. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, and so I'm taking pictures. This picture is uh, a picture of this is in my book. And as we're sitting there, the plane is still flying and it flies in front of us and it starts writing another message. Um, and it writes, and it's on a different wind plane. Jesse and Jesus never moved. It, it was a little blurry when we made the turn, but it never went away. This other message, went, each, each time the plane wrote a letter, it went away. So I could never get a picture of it. And it was you plus God dash smiley face. And I couldn't get a picture of it. I was ready. But I looked at JT and I said, this message is for us too. And he said, I know. And I said, it's, it's a message that we need to stay close to God to be happy. And he said, I, I know, you know, his eyes were wide, just like mine. And, uh, and so I knew, I knew that that message was for me to confirm that Jesse wasn't back with Jesus, but he was also here listening to me and with me and comforting me. And, uh, you know, I to I've told that story so many times, and and I, I remember friends and family saying, "Oh my gosh, don't you want to call down and find out who did that?" Don't you know? And I I would say, "No, I have no interest in calling down and find I know who did that." Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, it doesn't even matter if it was the Papa John's pizza guy. Right. I know what it, it was. It was, you know, for me. And, and it said that. And I have a picture of it. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. Oh. And, uh, and actually, one, my neighbor did come uh, the following summer. She, um, she came over and she said, you know, I have a surprise for you. And I said, what is that? And she said, well, you know, I felt led to call down and find out who wrote that message. And she said, so I called down to the Orlando airport and I said, you know, there's skywriting on a certain day. I need to find out who did it. She said, evidently, there are a small group of skywriters. And she said, I spoke to them and no one knew who wrote that message. And I said, of course not. <laughs> you know, of course they didn't because we know who wrote the message. Yeah. What so a gift, was, Scarlett. Wow. Yes. Yeah. What a gift. It was a huge gift. And, and I took a lot of comfort from it. And, um, and feel very blessed. And how was that. your healing vacation? Were you able to have um, some, I don't know if fun is the word, but just get your mind off a little bit and, and just good time with JT? You know, we, we did have a good time. We swam, we played tennis, we went to the parks. But it's, uh, you know, I, I, 
just little things that trigger that, I mean, obviously kids, they still trigger me. So it's the same thing, you know, seeing six-year-old boys, uh, seeing a dark head turned around thinking, oh, my God, oh, there he is. Jesse. Yeah, of course. <laughs> right, there he is. Uh, and then um, I, uh, going in someplace and there was a huge nutcracker, like 20 feet tall. And Jesse loves the, you know, the figurine nutcrackers. Mm -hmm. yep. And I, and then, and, you know, just not really, um, n not really knowing uh, when or how you're going to break down, but trying to just kind of exist. And, and I remember going in, trying to find directions and seeing that nutcracker and coming out and trying to be strong for JT, but I just got into the car and broke down, crying hysterically. And JT kind of, he stiffens up <laughs> and he yeah. kind of looks at me out the corner of his eye. And, uh, and I just said, I'm sorry, JT. I just saw this nutcracker and Jesse loves nutcrackers and I'm just so sad. And, and JT said, mom, you know, time is different in heaven than it is here. I have no idea where he got this, by the way, but it was brilliant. And he said, so so when we go through time here, it, it seems like a long time, but we're, and it's, and he was saying, and, it, and it's like this, and he was going, he was moving his hand horizontally, but he said, where Jesse is, it's like no time at all. Um, he said, time is like this, and he moved up and down, and he said, so so Jesse doesn't feel the time going by, and we're going to be with him in no time at all. And I was just like, I was like, I just stopped crying. I was stunned by the brilliance of what he was saying and how he could know that. And I said, you're right. Thank you for reminding me that. That's beautiful and true. And, and so we, we were able to kind of, move through this and 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 when i had just extreme weakness he was strong and and the other way around and we've just kind of made it through together somehow wow <laughs> scarlett it's interesting that you say that about time or jt said that that is extremely profound i've interviewed now your episode number 93 which is very exciting wow yes yeah um and i've interviewed many people that have had near death experiences and there was some pretty awesome things and that is some that is something that they get from their experience in the hereafter is this is this um difference in time and so for JT to say that like that is as if Jesse whispered it in his ear because it's it's yeah. not something that's well known it's not something that's well talked about I mean and even I say it to a lot of people that are grieving who either listen to my show or read my book just the fact that in heaven it's a blink of an eye and we're all together again so they're not right. there grieving they're they're looking watching us live our life but there's there's no fear or sadness because it just you know in the second we'll all be together that's the experience so that's awesome that just gave me goosebumps when you shared that yeah wow. yeah and you just gave me a little bit more understanding of where that came from so thank you yeah i have i have no doubt i have witnessed mm -hmm. some really awesome things and, and I'm, I'm really grateful mm -hmm. to have this show and some of my listeners know this because hearing so many stories of life after death i mean just so many it is without a doubt no question i see my dad again jesse's going to be there to greet you in his arms yeah. when it's your time yeah. i mean it is so real and our mind that we have here on earth that can have anger and be really kind of messed up that mind leaves us at that moment of, of, of death thank goodness but it's about our life and it's about overcoming things and um and, you know, I want to get onto that with you and in, in your foundation and, and talk more about that. But I am without a doubt convinced that uh, we're going to see them all again. But this life is for a purpose. And and there are, and this is just my belief, that there are some angels among us that do some pretty courageous things so that others might have a great life. And I wouldn't doubt, but, um, you know, Jesse is one of these courageous souls that has impacted now you know, probably hundreds of thousands of people around the world, if not more by now. And, you know, you, you continue on and, and as does your foundation and this message. So, um, you know, Sandra, I, I believe that. And, and I, I feel like um, when, when I look at the message that he left, 
Um, and I feel like, and, and I will say this to him at times, you know, like you did the hard part of, of our mission here. You, you, you died so courageously and, and left this message and, and, and really passed the torch to me now right. to spread this message of nurturing, healing, love. And for sure, I got the easier part. And I can then, so I can certainly get up in the morning and do what I have to do, do everything in my power to use the message to cultivate a safer, more peaceful and loving world. Absolutely, I got the easier part of the job, um, but definitely it's a mission. And, you know, I we talk about post-traumatic growth. Right. I found my purpose through my incredible suffering, but, but I know why I was put on earth. And I know that it's to spread this message. And I'm so incredibly thankful for that. You know, I used to, I used to say a prayer at night um, after putting the boys to bed. And I would say, dear God, um, use us for your will. Um, and, uh, and, and, and how can I be of service? Um, now, December 14th was not God's will because we have free will. Yeah, and, and we cultivated everything that happened on that day. I mean, Adam Lanza, what, the shooter, was a, a person in a tremendous amount of pain who had cried out uh, consistently for help throughout his life and never been given the nurturing um, and, and, and care and concern that he deserved from anybody. And, um, and so, you know, I'm part of that environment, um, but that was definitely our own free will. Um, but then after, after Jesse died, I, it took me a little while, but I eventually found myself praying again mm -hmm. and saying, okay, if I was in this a hundred percent before, <laughs> I'm doubling down and I'm in it 150% now. So go ahead, bring it on, <laughs> you know, use me. I'm in service. I'm going to continue this to the very end and I'm going to do everything in my power to be in service to other people and to make this a better world. Wow, and you sure have. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about you just sharing your passion and your commitment for doing all this. Grief is... A killer. I mean, I and you and many others who have experienced deep grief know that. I mean, it is one of the most painful things, if not the most painful thing, like a human being has to endure. And yes. I know that grief is a journey. It's a um, besides an emotional one. Like our body has to readjust to our new surroundings with this loss. So our brains actually shift. There's neurotransmitters and a chemical change and there's this whole thing going on in our system. So you can't just turn it on or turn it off or read a book or something. You just, oh yeah, yeah, I get through grief. It's been a few days. You should be fine now. No, 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 no. But I do know and I've seen so much evidence of people that direct their life on a focus or find a passion or i mean you've started your nonprofit. other people um have, have done other things you know just in service and by mm -hmm. refocusing the intention it really helps the brain in the healing process and in, in this chemical process get our neurotransmitters and our chemistry uh back to a healthier place that we are not um so down, you know, because you know, mm -hmm. I, mean, you can, I, I don't know how you felt, but I mean, it, it's it's dark, and uh, there's often suicides that come out of um, grief and depression and things like that. So uh, good for you to focus on something so much more mighty, mightier than yourself, and I and that coupled with knowing that Jesse's still around um, and having a, a mission, I, I think. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong that that made a difference in your life to have something to focus on. Well, I remember standing at Jesse's grave with, you know, the fresh dirt. And I remember having this thought, like, I could just crumble into that dirt. Like, yeah. I, I'm surprised I still have form because I feel like I should just be dirt. And, I mean, that was how low it was. And, um, but, but definitely I found strength that I didn't think that I had and and I found a purpose on um, this all this post-traumatic growth I, I learned lessons and I think one of the lessons that you learn 
through um, through tremendous loss is is the reason that we're all here, and, and that reason is to be in service to one another. Yes, um, that's 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 all. And so <laughs> that's I, it. That's pretty and, profound. That's, that's all. Right. Yeah, that's and, great. Uh, and I and I remember um, I was talking to you about this earlier. Um, within a day or two uh, after Jesse's murder, sitting on the couch in my mom's living room and having this incredible feeling. It was an incredible feeling. It was a, it was this, inc- this lightness of being this, this beauty. And I was like, how could I be feeling? This is such a dichotomy. I I'm at the worst point. I'm at the lowest point in my life. I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to go on or if I am yet I'm feeling this feeling. What is this feeling? And it was uh, all my fear had gone. I was without fear um, for the first time in my life. And it was this strange feeling. I mean, and, and I realized, oh, my God, my worst fear has happened. And, and now I have no fear of death. Um, and, and, and it was this, this epiphany, really. And I, I was able to look back over my life. And I was able to see all the decisions that I made that were fear-based mm-hmm. and, and, and how all those decisions got me to the point where I was. And I was able to have compassion for myself because I understood why I had that fear and, and why I thought I had to make the decisions that I made. And then I made a commitment to myself um, and, and I, I, I hoped that I would be able to have this fearlessness for the rest of my life. Um, and and I, I, I made a commitment to myself to really be conscious about making decisions out of a place of, of pure faith or love uh, and, and not fear. And um, I've really tried to do that. I've, I've felt a little bit of this earthly fear creep back in over the last maybe two years, mm-hmm. like, um, you know, wanting to be there for JT right, as of long as needs me. Um, wanting to see my mission through on earth um, with the Jesse Lewis Choose Love movement and um, and my passion, which is this um, free Choose Love Enrichment Program, which is social-emotional learning and character values based on the latest neuroscience, free because I feel like every child is entitled to this 21st century life skill uh, learning, which is life saving and life life changing, it's the fundamentals that our kids need to be happy and and lead um, healthy, physically, mentally, and emotionally uh, uh, well adjusted lives and become pillars of society. They need social emotional learning. This is based on thirty years of research. We know what the issue is. <laughs> we know what the solution is. It's just bringing those two together, and I'm trying to do that through my program. How do we find um, more out more about that program? Because I don't, I, uh, I want to research yes. more and share that. Because you know, it, every kid should get it, but inside every single person you see is a big kid with our unaddressed issues and all that stuff. So I mean, that's that's really profound, especially if it's free. Um, yeah, how can we find out more about that? Absolutely. Um, on the website, jessielewischooselove.org, and um, we're just putting the finishing touches on pre-K through fifth. We're going to have an incredible high school program. There's almost no social-emotional learning for high schoolers. This is, this is a program that can be used in, in any kind of setting for Great. adults as well. And, uh, and also, and then uh, we're currently writing the middle school program. So it will all be released by fall this year um, free free resources. Um, we're going to start releasing videos. We have big plans. And, and these are, this is information that people need to, to live the best, most fulfilled, most purpose-driven life that they can. It's just age-old wisdom. And, um, and I, I'm just, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be able to do this and, and uh, so, so grateful and appreciative um, and with lots of great people working with us. I work with a group of passionate and dedicated teachers. So this is the only program that's written by teachers for teachers. Um, and it's it's just really exciting. Scarlett, you have my promise that I will do whatever I can to support and get the word out once you have everything launched live. Um, well, awesome. Thank you. That is so important. But it brings me to a question for right now for all of us there is a lot of fear there's hateful thoughts there's negative thoughts 
um, how can we use some of the tools that you teach and Jesse's shared with compassion to go from a place of negativity to positivity? Do you have any idea? I do, and that's a beautiful question. And at Jesse's funeral, I stood up and I said, this whole tragedy started with an angry thought in Adam Lanza's head. And, and I picture him as a little boy having angry thoughts. You talked about the wiring in our brain that we know can be changed through neuroplasticity, mm-hmm. how every thought impacts our cells and genes through epigenetics, um, the study of epigenetics. And, and I said, an angry thought can be changed. We just need the awareness and consciousness to be able to disassociate ourselves from our thoughts, to understand that we are not our thoughts. Think about the languaging that we say. I am angry. Right. <laughs> right. Well, I am not anger. I am having an angry thought. And it's just that awareness that gives us a tool to be able to analyze and examine that thought. Why yes. am I angry? Right. And if we understand that anger, I look at Adam Lanza. That's a, that's a, a really, um, Great example. His anger came from pain. The majority of the anger that we see comes from pain. Anger is not a primary emotion. It's based on something. And, uh, and it's usually based on fear, um, and pain. And then we become angry. And, um, and it's, it's just a thought. And so when somebody, we're, we're angry because of things that are going on in the world. Something said, somebody said or did something to us, insulted us, uh, did something and it makes us angry, right? But by by allowing somebody to impact our emotions, we're giving up control over ourselves. So somebody insults me and I'm saying, I'm going to let you take control of my thoughts. That's how powerful I'm. I'm giving you the power over my life. And if we understand that, then we can step back and say, with this new understanding, okay, I'm having an angry thought. Where did that come from? Why did that person say that? Um, That person, I wonder what's going on in that person's life. I wonder if he's in pain. I wonder if he's trying to project his pain on me. I wonder if there's something going on at home. And so our response, instead of reacting with the same energy and trying to hurt and insult that person back, which is what a reaction would be, we can respond and we can say, gee, what's wrong with you? What, what, what's going on in your life? Is everything okay? And that completely diffuses the situation. This is a positive way to handle bullying. Instead of, you know, these, you know, teaching anti-bullying, two double negatives, right? right? Um, teach kids, uh, give kids an alternative. Uh, teach them how to choose love. That's an alternative. Instead of teaching them about the issue, instead of focusing on the negative, and what happens when we focus on the negative? It grows. Give kids an alternative to be able to choose a positive and to choose love. We all just want to love and be loved. That is a primal need. Children die without it. That is beyond culture, beyond race. We all just want to love and be loved. And we can choose that love for ourselves and for others. And it's It can be based on Jesse's formula of choosing love, which is having the courage to feel grateful, even when things aren't going your way, the courage to forgive, even if the person who hurt you isn't sorry, and the courage to step outside of your own pain and be in service to others. Because when you do things for other people, that's when the line between the giver and the receiver is blurred. That's when you get as much love as you give out as much love and healing. So that's the way to choose love. And that's the message that I believe needs to get out there. Instead of focusing on the negative, let's focus on the positive. Oh my gosh, that was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. We filled my eyes with tears. And I think that mm-hmm. those are words that can impact all of us. Um, in what you just said, you just uh, mentioned forgiveness. Can you just speak a little bit about forgiveness? Is it possible have you forgiven Adam and and if you could just talk a little bit about forgiveness because sometimes you think well how could you forget forgive someone like that of course and forgiveness is um has probably been the most powerful decision that I've made and the reason that I'm 
able to do what I'm doing today with the Jesse Lewis Choose Love Movement is based on my choice to forgive. I've learned so much about forgiveness, Sandra. Um, and, and I went to church growing up. I didn't learn about, I, I knew that we should forgive so that we are forgiven. Uh, we don't teach it at schools. We don't talk about it. Um, we, we basically know nothing about forgiveness in our society. I had to learn it all myself. And what I learned was that, um, forgiveness is, is not a gift you give the other person. It's a gift that you give yourself. Forgiveness cuts the cord to pain that the other person is causing you. It, it gives you your personal power back. It doesn't mean that you're not holding the other person accountable for their right. actions. Right. It just it, it means that um, that you are taking power back yourself. And um, I I you know I remember um, thinking about Adam and, and, and the day after the shooting and thinking that somebody that could have done something so heinous must have been in a tremendous amount of pain. And, and, and I saw him not as a monster, but as a human being. And, and I, I felt compassion for him. And then when I, when I did a little bit of research and I found out his background, how he'd been denied social and emotional learning services that he needed, how uh, he had been shunned by his classmates because wow. of differences wow. that they perceived, how he had cried out for help, Sandra, throughout his entire childhood, and no one had ever given him the kindness, caring, and concern that he needed. Um, and and I, I, I saw him as a victim, really uh, just as much as, as the people that he murdered because he, he was entitled to love as a human being and he really didn't receive it. And he therefore did not know how to choose that for himself. And he, he became anger. He did not have the awareness that they were just thoughts. He was anger and it turned into rage. And, and we know that every angry thought um, changes the wiring in our brain, changes us on a cellular level, um, as you were saying before, and anger turns into rage, and rage uh, causes mental illness. It's um, what fills our prison systems and leads to acts of violence, such as Sandy Hook. And, of course, the amazing thing is, is that, you know, it all started with an angry thought, and an angry thought could be changed. So... I felt compassion for him um, through uh, the first act of forgiveness that moved to compassion. And, um, and of course, forgiveness is a choice. It starts out with a choice. You make that choice to forgive. And, uh, and then it turns into a process because it's not like I, I wouldn't hear details about what happened on that day um, that made me angry. And, uh, and it's, it's not like I'm not a human being. I, I, you know, this tragedy brought out the best of the best in people and yeah. the worst of the worst. And there are people that, you know, have tried to take advantage of the tragedy. Um, and, and there are people that have just been so incredibly, you know, beautiful and, and pure and honest with great intentions. And, uh, and so I, forgiveness is a process, you know, and I practice it every day and I make that choice and I, I find myself feeling bad, having angry thoughts and I, I know that I need to forgive again. And, uh, and I remember, um, being a little girl in Sunday school and Jesus was giving, you know, talking to, I think it was Matthew about forgiveness. And he said, uh, forgive, um, seven times, 77 times seven, I think it was. And uh, that was what Jesus told him to do. And I remember doing the math. Okay, all right, 77 times seven. So that's 490. So if I forgive 490 times during my life, I'm okay. And then I had this epiphany, this realization after Jesse died through my own um, learning about forgiveness that that's not what he meant. He meant 77 times 7 per transgression. He meant that forgiveness starts with a choice and then it just becomes a continuous process, something that you have to do every single day. And, and that's okay. 
It, it doesn't mean that we failed. It just means that we have to forgive again. And and forgiveness is something that you do for yourself. You, you take responsibility um, for your pain and you choose to cut the cord. You choose to give yourself all the power back and you choose to be able to live your life fully with freedom from from hurt. And, uh, and so that has been so... So, such an important part of my process and also I for I, I include forgiveness in a big way in our lessons because nobody really teaches about it and it's so incredibly important to our our resilience and our connection to each other wow really great I hold your book in my hands right now and for our listener nurturing healing love is the title by Scarlett Lewis and it's available everywhere just everywhere and um, if you want a quick link to it on Amazon you can go to we don't die radio.com episode 93 Scarlett Lewis and see it there um, in order if you like and how about a little bit about your foundation uh, this Jesse Lewis foundation how can we use it either support your foundation or are there some tools on there that we can use or how do we get involved as the listeners right now yes thank you for that sandra um so right now our our major goal is developing this choose love enrichment program um which will be ready in the fall and you know as as parents as as grandparents i think it's really important that we ask questions um we have this uh these these lessons they're called social and emotional learning um you can look up that term on the internet it's been around for a long time there's tons of research that shows that when children have access to social and emotional learning that they get better grades um this is not academic learning this is uh this is self-awareness it's emotional intelligence it's responsible decision making. It's um, it's all sorts of of social and emotional learning. And when kids have this type of learning, they get better grades, higher test scores. They are less anxious. Um, they uh, are more likely to graduate. They have less absences. We have long term. Uh, studies now that have followed kids that have gotten social emotional learning in kindergarten all the way through adulthood and they are more likely to go on to college less likely to get divorced um they're wow. more likely to become pillars of our society i mean every single study that comes out on social emotional learning is so incredible and and at the same time it reduces anxiety it reduces instances of mental illness it reduces rates of incarceration it reduces substance abuse so i mean we we've tended to focus on the negative so we have this war on drugs right um, we have state mandated um drug um, programs that don't really work, but we don't know what else to do. We have um, state mandated anti-bullying programs, which are not terribly effective. We have uh, sex education that focuses on the negative aspects of sex. We have suicide prevention in our schools. But so we're telling kids, this is what you can't do to feel good, but we're not giving them an alternative and we're not giving them a positive option, which would be to teach them to choose love and tell them what that's about. I mean, I've been in prisons and I've spoken with convicted felons, who, these people who are considered non-rehabilitatable. And after learning the formula for choosing love, they want to choose love in their lives. Of course they do. We all want to feel good. Choosing love feels good. Being angry and resentful and hateful, that feels bad. We all in the end just want to feel good and be loved. Uh, so, so asking those questions of your administrators, hey, do we have a social and emotional learning program in this school? Really? Um, we do? Great. What, what is it? Um, and if you don't, why? Why don't we? Can we look into getting one? Um, and, and just really getting a little bit more involved. Three years ago or three and a half years ago, I don't think I knew what social and emotional learning was. Um, but it's so incredibly important. In fact, there was a report that came out uh, it, was a, it was a Sandy Hook School Commission, and, and it took a year for this report to be researched. And they were given the role of finding out what happened and how it could be prevented so that something like this could never happen again. And um, 
they determined um, one of three things. It was gun safety, it was more access to mental health, and equally as important was social and emotional learning. In fact, the report said, had Adam Lanza had access to social and emotional learning, this whole thing might not have happened. And so um, I, I, I found this out through Jesse's message of nurturing, healing, love. That happens to be the foundational components of social and emotional learning. So this is so important that we give this to our kids in every way. All the research for 30 years points to this being even more important than academic learning. Because when kids have social and emotional learning, academic learning comes. They get better grades. And, and people are so worried about, uh, uh, you know, performance and test scores and grades and competitiveness. Um, and and uh, amazingly, when kids are socially and emotionally aware, that comes. So, there, you know, we think, oh, there's no time to do that. There is time in the school day because kids, uh, it, it actually helps teachers too. I mean, kids are better behaved. Um, they get better grades and test scores when they right. have this social social learning. So everyone benefits. It is the foundation um, the, we all need as human beings starting right. at a young age. Yeah. Right. So ask the questions. Um, introduce the program. If, if the school doesn't have a budget for social emotional learning, say, hey, there is a social emotional learning program that's free. Yeah. Great. It's called the Choose Love Enrichment Program. Introduce that there. Uh, and all the resources, everything is going to be free. And um, and so I'm just really excited about this. It is my mission in life, my personal mission, to make sure that every child has access to this life-saving and life-changing initiative. Scarlett, can you tell us about JT and where he's at with all of this and what he's up to? Yes, definitely. So, so um, a JT did not go back to school, obviously, um, right away, and he was having a lot of anger. Um, in fact, he punched a hole in his wall in his bedroom, um, and and I knew that I couldn't help him. Um, I was dealing with surviving on my own. In fact, at the firehouse, I remember saying a prayer. Um, God, you're going to have to, you know, if, if this is the way it's going to go, you're going to have to take care of JT. I'm not going to be able to do that. I, I, I'm not going to be able to do this. And, uh, and so uh, I remember calling the school because uh, it was like three weeks and, um, and, I, and I couldn't get him to go back to school. I would go in in the morning and say, JT, do you want to go to school? And he would say no. And I remember feeling this profound sense of relief. <laughs> I didn't really want him to go to school. Right. I, I, I had sent one kid off to school and he never came home. And, and so I will, and, and to this day, I don't want JT to know this, but I'll never force him to go. So I, I called the school and I said, I'm having a lot of, I can't get JT to go to school and you guys aren't even calling for uh, for attendance anymore. I feel like we're slipping through the cracks here. And they said, well, you know, maybe he is, maybe he just redoes seventh grade. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I said, no, he is not going to be punished for right. his brother having been murdered. You know, we have to figure this out. I, I need help here. Like, I, I don't know what to do. And they said, well, uh, we're traumatized here. You know, really, what do you want from us? And so we were alone. And um, this group of orphan genocide survivors from Rwanda reached out to JT um, through a woman, who, through, through Nick Ortner, who uh, is uh, author of The Tapping Solution, and he lives in Newtown. He was doing um, some some um, trauma relief efforts. And he brought this woman in who had just come back from Rwanda. She had a group of, of students that she worked with. And um, those that group had heard about what happened at Sandy Hook. They wanted to reach out to JT to, uh, to talk to him, to share their experience. So we set up this Skype in his bedroom the wow. big hole in his wall right behind him. And these two beautiful orphan genocide survivors from Rwanda got on the screen with an interpreter in the middle. And they said, JT, we are so sorry about what happened to your little brother. We heard all the way over here in Rwanda. And we just want you to know, we, we want to share our experience with you and let you know that you're going to be okay and you're going to feel joy again. And I remember I'm standing behind him thinking, okay, uh, no one has had any credibility that's worked with me thus far. Like people were putting their hand on my knee and saying, 
time heals all wounds. You're going to be okay. You know, and I'm thinking, how the how heck do you, do you know? You know? You've, yeah. You've never been through anything like this. I don't feel like I'm going to be okay. And here were people that had gone through something worse. And they were telling us that we were going to feel joy again and we were going to be okay. And so I knew they had credibility and I wanted to hear what they had to say. So they start sharing their experience. And Chantel was eight years old when her neighbors um, had uh, burst through the, her, her neighbors, she lived next to her whole life, um, broke into her house, macheted her entire family to death in front of her and oh, then grabbed her gosh. by the hair. She, she's telling this story, grabbed her by the hair, slit her throat buried her in a shallow grave amongst all of her family members. And then she had to hide there for days because they, the killers had lists. Now, this was the uh, genocide in Rwanda that happened in 1994, where over one million Tutsis were murdered by their neighboring Hutus within 90 days. She had to stay in the shallow grave for uh, days because they had lists and they were responsible for making sure that, that the people on their list were murdered. And, uh, and when they left, she dug her way out, found her way into an orphanage, and she said, it's, uh, it's when my physical wounds healed that I started feeling this profound sense of gratitude, grateful for the people that were giving me compassion, the little amount of food, the protection of the walls. And then she said, that gratitude gave me the strength to be able to realize I have to forgive these people. If I don't forgive them, I'm going to go down the same path of anger and destruction that they went down. And then once she forgave, she said that gave her the strength to step outside of her own pain and use find meaning in her suffering by using her story to help other people like she was doing with JT. And then Matthew had a slightly different story. He and his family escaped into the mountains and ate grass for just about three months while they watched the destruction of their community. And his mother died of starvation. His father was so traumatized when they got back to their home that he couldn't work. So all the, all the farming, all of, all of the responsibility for his siblings fell on Matthew's shoulders, but he loved school so much, even though he would never be anything other than a subsistence farmer, no running water, no electricity, nothing other than subsistence farming. He wanted to go to school. So in the morning, he walked down a mountain for two hours and then back up in the afternoon, no breakfast, no lunch, because they couldn't afford it just to go to school. So wow. after after this experience, we went into my living room, sat on our respective couches, looked at each other, and they had given us a formula, <laughs> basically, for choosing love. By the way, it's the exact same formula that Jesse wrote on our kitchen chalkboard, which I didn't put two and two together until later, but I said, we started, we started making a list of the things that we were grateful for, and we realized there was a lot. We had our farm. We had our aminals. Jesse calls all our animals. We have four dogs and horses and chickens. And, and we had our family and friends. And we had neighbors bringing food to our door every night. And we had each other, which was the big thing. Yes. And, uh, and then we both made the conscious decision to forgive. And uh, we just started there. And then uh, I saw JT. He opened a, people were sending us beautiful gifts from all around the world. And we got, had a whole stack of journals that we hadn't opened. And he started writing in a journal. And I said, what are you writing? And this is a quote. I'll never forget it. Those kids reached out to me in love, and I'm going to reach back out to them. I'm going to start raising money to send them to college. And he started, he went back to school on his own the very next day. And he started an organization called NewtownHelpsRwanda.org. And he raised enough money within a couple of months to Skype back to that same group and announced to a woman named Betty that he had raised enough money for her to go to university for a one year plus an additional amount to help her family because they're orphans and they live in big family groups. And her family group was nine members. Her amount of income that she made for the family group was $400. And without that money, they couldn't survive. So JT made an additional $400 and made this announcement and then uh, made a commitment to raise the rest of the money needed for her education. And, uh, and he's continued that effort um, for the last three and a half years. He did uh, raise the additional three years. He's helped build self-sustaining fish ponds for former children soldiers in Rwanda. I'm sorry, Uganda. He's helped countless kids in Connecticut that have been through trauma. And, and I have to say, he is healing himself because healing is a lifelong progress process through 
being in service to others. JT won't go see a therapist. Uh, it didn't work for him. He, he doesn't want to talk to anybody. Um, and, and the only therapy he has is being in service to other people. And he's doing that through Newtown Helps Rwanda. And, and I have to tell you that, um, he is, he has grown so much in the last three and a half years. Uh, and, and he's almost unrecognizably, uh, unrecognizable physically, but also, um, also just as a person. He is incredibly compassionate, incredibly mature, and so loving and kind. And, uh, and so I think the lesson that we have is the power of doing things for other people. Remember I said when you go through something terribly traumatic, you realize the reason we're here and the reason we're here on earth is to help one another. And, and he came to that. I didn't tell him to do it. If I had told him to do it, he probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> right. He just right. did this, um, through the example of the other kids wanting to give back the love that he received and, and do things for other people as other people had done for him, by the way. I mean, we saw the world practice this compassion in action, um, through all the response that they gave us after Jesse's murder. And by the way, continue to give us beautiful notes beautiful handmade gifts from mostly children and and when they're doing that they're helping us and they're helping themselves at the same time Mm -hmm. it's a beautiful thing and it's so incredibly powerful and it's also uh, a lesson that i've put into the choose love enrichment program Mm -hmm. because jt um his courage uh it inspires me and is just so amazing so yes. I, I, I always love sharing that story. Yeah, thank you for sharing that because it just shows us that we can all do that and we can actually find our own healing in making a difference in the area that's important to us. And thank JT also for us because he will go on for a long time making a difference. I'm sure you talk about him often, and but also on this show will go on for a long, long time. And also it will be really interesting to see how he grows up as a young man and the man he becomes and the difference he continues to make. So that's a really good thing you have to look forward to in the future yes thank you thank Thank you you. i I encourage i encourage all of your um listeners to check out his website as well it's www.newtownhelpsrwanda.org scarlett thank you Our, our time is coming to an end um and i just want to give you a big hug right now and thank you for who you are your stand for others and and what you're up to i mean it is a beautiful thing and I'm super grateful that you introduced introduced us to post traumatic growth. Yes. Because we all have things and they may not be as monumental as what you have gone through, but some of them are and just Absolutely. out of that things can happen. So I want to close the show first of all with a gigantic thank you to you, Scarlett, for giving us your time, your story, uh opening your heart to us and um i it's made a really big difference in my life and i'm assuming it has too and uh, those who are listening so thank you thank you sandra thank you for helping me spread jesse's message of yeah. nurturing healing up it's my pleasure and also for our listener thank you for being engaged in this conversation for the last hour and some minutes um again i hope it's made a difference in your life i think it has i mean i don't know how it couldn't because it really is some profound words and i think of jesse lewis and i have a picture of him uh on we don't die radio.com and you can look at his beautiful face and and his mom and just a reminder from the words that that scarlet used is uh have compassion be grateful forgive choose love and what a beautiful gift her son jt also got is have a lot of fun i mean life can be really heavy at some point but at some point too it can be a playground for our soul i mean we can find time to love and and to have some fun so in closing um my name is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. Uh, I want to invite you to visit Scarlett Lewis's website at jessielewischooselove.org and get involved. I mean, what a, what a really profound uh, organization it is. And I want you to remember that we are souls having a human experience. Our loved ones are still around. We will get to see them again. Your life is for a purpose. 
uh, I will take this on today to also is to go out and make a difference for another. So I want to thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.